I don't get into politics when I'm on set. I got a job to do, and that's the job I, that they're paying me to do, and I'm going to do that job in my best ability. So I don't get into the politics at all. Um, I'm there to do a job. I'm going to do it. And I'm, everybody understands that. I'm not going to play games. everyone. Welcome back to American Snippets. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We have another awesome show for you. Our guest today is a former Marine who now works in Hollywood. His career as a military technical advisor for some of the biggest movies made started by Chance while he was still actively serving in the United States Marines. He was actually assigned to work alongside Clint Eastwood, and his job was to ensure that Clint accurately portrayed the role of a Marine. After 25 years of service, today's guest actively picked up where that experience left off, and he pursued a professional career in Hollywood. With blockbusters like Heartbreak Ridge, the Last Samurai and other award-winning films under his belt and his resume, James is at the top of his game and at the top of the industry. In this episode of American Sippets, James Deaver shares his personal story that led him to the Marines and some, behind, and some behind the scenes mishaps on some of the biggest movies. He also shares uh, and offers some insight into Hollywood trends and what it takes to actually produce a quality military movie. And he gives us his unique view of what the American dream means to him. So without further ado, here is Barbara Allen with James Deaver. Hey there, welcome back to another episode of American Snippets. I'm your co-host, Barb Allen, and you all just heard Dave uh, describe to you our guest today, Sergeant Major, retired James Devers of the United States Marine Corps, uh, is here with us today, and this is going to be another really fun time getting to know our guests and hearing a story. Um, you are somebody with a story we have not done before. Uh, your industry, your career is very interesting now. And um, obviously you had a very deep start in your life and that led, led you there. Um, let's start first, sir. But can you tell us what a military technical advisor is in Hollywood? A military technical advisor in Hollywood. Well, he has to be aware of the situation what you're working on, what movies you're working on. And time period, you know, period pieces, modern day. So what my I do is I work with the director and his assistant directors. Also, I work with the prop master, making sure that we have the right props for the right period of what they're carrying, the actors, or the background. I work with the art department from everything from the art department with the uh, stencils on correct on 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 buildings or on vehicles because they make the uh, stencils for military vehicles. Also, the, the barracks, if we're having a barracks, uh, how it's supposed to look like, like an American sniper getting the uh, BUDS uh, training area done correctly, making sure everything looks right. Or when we do a Marine Corps movie, like Megan Levy, getting the yellow footprints down at Paris Island, things like that, making it correct with the art department. I also work with wardrobe making sure the uniforms is correct for the period, be it Army, Navy, Air Force, or Marine Corps. So I, I work with all the departments within a crew working on a set. So it's uh, all day work, never sit down, and uh, I'm there to answer questions. But again, I'm only an advisor. I, they don't have to listen to me. I'm only an advisor. So... Uh, I, t I tell the director the right way, the wrong way, and of course the director's way. What is that like for you when you put all this time and effort into it and someone's like, dude, we appreciate what you say, but we're going to do it our way instead? Yeah, you know, it does happen. <laughs> and, uh, and I look at, at the individual, but I said, okay. But what I do is also make it as correct as possible. I mean, it could be off on, let's say, a uh, formation. Uh, we're doing a patrol. They like, you know, normally we're spread out a lot to keep distance. 
what they want for camera, they needed everybody close. So we bring everybody close, but that's okay because I understand working in the business that you have to have that, you know, camera got to see everybody. You can't just see one person. So, but no, I try to make it as real as possible for what I have. If they want it done this way, then I make it real for what he wants, the director. So in order to wind up doing the the work that you do now, you can't just, like, I can't go into the world of Hollywood and be a military technical advisor, right? I don't know what the hell I'm talking about, really. <laughs> and the, all those movies, you know, look just fine to me. Uh, so you obviously bring with you a lot of real life experience as uh, over 25 years, something like 25 years in the United States Marine Corps. That's correct, 25 years. And I bring that experience on the set also, you know, how to carry weapons. Uh, the way we carry weapons today, modern day, are completely different in period pieces. So I have to make sure to teach those actors, just because they watch a modern day movie, oh, you got to keep the weapon a little ready. No, back in the old days, you carry it this way. So you got to make sure that everything is set for the period that you're working in. And it takes a lot. Of, I wasn't in the Civil War. But I read books about the Civil War and I read manuals of training in, for the Civil War tactics and for a manual of arms. So I used that in The Last Samurai by reading books on that. I wasn't there, but I have to understand military tactics and military um, discipline and the way um, they carry themselves. So I, I try to explain that to the background and also to the actors. So I am fortunate to know a lot of Marines and a lot of military and veterans in particular. Um, and what I see here before me, we're just having a casual conversation, like we're nice and easy. I'm going to go ahead and imagine that you have a separate demeanor when you're actually, um, you know, on duty in the United States Marine Corps. And if that is so, do you bring that attitude? Do we get this person right here on set at a movie or do we get the Marine? Well, you get a different person on set. <laughs> <laughs> you get the Marine. Yes. Yeah. Uh, when I train uh, the actors or background, I, I explain to them also that, hey, I've been in the Marines. I'm going to treat you like uh, whatever service we're doing, Army, Navy, Air Force, but it'd be disciplined. And I'm going to tell you to move, you move, things like that. I don't just go, can you please move over there? <laughs> I, I, I'll march guys on, I'll tell them, you know, what to do, but I use a different kind of voice. My Marine voice comes out and, and the way I act, like my, I never sit down on set. I'm always standing because of the sitting. I always say, Hey, I might miss something. So I move around I'm making sure everybody, and I look at the monitors, checking everything, making sure that what camera sees, I have to correct. So that for the next take. So I have to check that also. But no, I use a completely different voice and attitude <laughs> when I'm on set. So would they be surprised if people you've worked with in these films sit down and watch this interview? Are they going to be like, who the hell is that guy right there? Yes, sometimes, <laughs> yes. I mean, when I'm, it's funny. When I'm sitting, like I'm talking to you, I'll, yeah. I'll be talking to the actors that way. But also when we're rolling or we're getting ready, now I'm completely different using my voice, commands, and everything else because a lot of times in all the movies I work on I have like a mini boot camp for them depending on the uh, production how long so I I get into what the act is in the background what they need to know and I and I always tell them to just remember the uniform you're wearing people have died in that uniform so respect it and respect what you're doing so I tell them that also yeah is that a huge culture shock for them I don't know, maybe you work with actors who this is not their first military movie and they're more used to it, or they've worked with somebody who had a different style that didn't go into such detail as you, but is it uh, a different, is it, is it a culture shock for them to come? You know, they're an actor, especially maybe bigger names or maybe the people who are in background and think, I don't what I'm just background. Why do I have to do all this for, you know, do you, do you run into any of that sort of resistance ever on set or in the boot camps? <laughs> Resistance, not really resistance. They don't know. A lot of the, the background I, I get, you know, never been in the military. I, I don't pick the background. But when I bring background on board, 
I bring military guys on. I have a team. I'll bring military guys on that know what's going on, and they'll be in the foreground. And the other background, you know, they'll be in the background on that. But they have to be trained. But no, I don't get resistance. They just don't know how the military is, you know, until they hear the barking sounds of my voice, then they understand. But here's the thing. I, I give them respect also. What I mean by that is I understand they don't, they don't know anything about the military, the males and females that show up. But I explain it to them. And I'm going to tell, and I tell them what's going to happen. And when you hear my voice, but they have a great time like I do too. Cause I, I could tell them you're here to work on a, a, sh- a show, but you're also here to enjoy yourself too and get it right. So that's the key. You're there to have fun also, but you're supposed to get everything right when you're filming. Yeah. And you know, some of the movies that you've done and worked on, I've seen, I'm probably more than I realize, um, you know, I've seen Taya Kyle. She's a good friend of mine. And, uh, and so I saw American Sniper before I got to know Taya. And as a military widow myself, it was a little hard for me, you know, to watch some of it, but what, even without knowing Taya at the time, and then after getting to know her and going back and watching the movie, one thing that hit me was how, how un-Hollywood, you know, sometimes you can see movies that they put in, they work so hard on putting in special effects. I, I feel like you lose the the significance of the moment or the plot. And so one thing that just struck me on the things that I did see that you all worked on is that it just seems more focused on telling the actual story than on like bling, you know, and, and putting that all out. So that was really cool. Is that, is that more of the director's hand? Is that a combination of people that say like, Hey, we're going to just focus on, on the story and the moment and the meaning and stay true to that instead of trying to like over impress with special effects and, you know, go over, spend more effort on special effects than on plot, I guess is what I'm saying. No, we're working on American Sniper, yeah. Sniper with Clint Eastwood. No, he wanted to tell the story, you yeah. know, on, on Chris Kyle and, and on the Navy SEALs and, and the Marines that were there in Fallujah and, and, and the battles that we showed in the film. So he is very unique, Clint Eastwood. He makes everybody on his set, you are expected to do your job. So when we were in Morocco, we had three days to train the Moroccans that didn't speak English. So we had interpreters. I mean, we went out over 150, 200 Moroccans playing Marines. These are over there. We had, they brought in about 10 uh, Europeans, but um, they're playing Marines and Navy SEALs. They don't speak English. We also had the Moroccan army to help us. And they don't speak English neither, except the Colonel, me and him got along. But hand and arm singles, we got to move the tanks and everything else with the help of my guys on that. But no, he wants you to do your job, Clint, and he's with the actors making sure that they're doing their job, which is unique. It's fantastic because through the training that we did before the filming with the actors, uh, we, sh- we, fil- we trained uh, in California, we trained on, on the set at Warner Brothers, and then we had boot camp in Morocco. Uh, he wanted to get it right. He wanted the story. Not much of special effects, if you notice, if you watch American Sniper, it's more about the story and the um, what went on in Iraq at that time. So it's really unique working with uh, Clint Eastwood on, on his movie. Yeah, I bet. And um, I feel like sometimes the saying less is more is right on point. So like for me, when watching those movies, when they have all the bling and special effects, I start caring less about the plot than about anything so i'm like <laughs> yes i understand completely <laughs> you know? correct like okay you know done great good um so what was that like now you're 20 something years in the marine corps how many how many about how many deployments did you have as well marine? i was i could pr- tell you uh as a marine at those 25 years i must have been deployed i want to say about 10 years or well, i would say 10 deployments more than that I, um, I, I spent uh, four Christmases in Hong Kong. Uh, I've been to Europe on NATO floats with, when I was in Camp Lejeune. I took deployments out of Okinawa to Okinawa. 
when I was young, the first deployment I went was as a young kid, uh, this 18, I went up to um, Okinawa, my first deployment. But then we went to different places out there, you know, Korea, Japan, mainland Japan, I should say, uh, Singapore and all that. And then came back and then went back out again for the evacuation of Saigon and Cambodia. And then, wow, yeah, I've been at sea a lot through my career. And it helped out me as a kid. I always was on the move. We were, when I was young, my family moved a lot. So to me, being gone doesn't bother me at all. Second nature. Do you have a family of your own through, through all that time in the Marine No, not Corps? all that time. No, not at all. A lot, of t- a, lot, a lot of the deployments were single. And then my later deployments, I was married. Yeah. And so can you talk for a minute about, I know you said you moved a lot um, as you were younger and we're going to backtrack a little bit into that as well, but for people who may not uh, be in the military or in the service, can you just give a little snapshot of what that is like when you're, when you have a family of your own and you're still leaving as well? Is that, it's something that a lot of people don't consider or think about when they're, it's just, they don't know anything about it, right? And it just seems like they take it for granted, I guess, a little, um, that the service member is the only one who serves. Correct. Well, yes, when you go on deployment and you yeah. leave your family behind, you know, you know, you leave everything. You're talking about, you know, who's going to take care of the bills, the kids, anything that happens, like a water heater goes out, whatever, the, the spouse has to take care of that. You can't take care of that. And in the military, what's, I found out civilians don't know that emergency leave, like if you're having a child, you don't go home for that. Yeah, military, that's not emergency leave. Having a, a baby, you, you're on deployment. Many of my Marines being on deployment had kids and they couldn't go home that they see their uh, son or daughter born. So that's one of the hardships that you have to work with. Also, in the Marine Corps, boy, when you go on deployment is worrying about the, uh, you know, you're going to get divorced or not for being away for so long. And especially the young Marines. It's, uh, but no, the civilians don't understand when you go away, like in the movie business, you have a kid, you could go home on that. No, not in, the, not in the military, none of the services. That's not emergency leave. Emergency leave is only an immediate family. And that's it. Yeah. And they don't consider your child the media family, right? I remember. Um, well, I, they do, but not, I, for having, not, having, not, having, not having a kid. <laughs> I know. I know. It's like uh, Major Caper said it. And uh, a lot of the Marines I know in particular, you know, if the Marine Corps wanted you to have a wife, we would have issued you one like kind of thing. Right. And so. That's right. <laughs> um, I, it seems like the more people I talk to, the more is like, they weren't necessarily kidding when they said that sometimes <laughs> it seems like, no, you know? not at all <laughs> Yeah, because you find out when you're on deployment. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I know. I know. And I remember my husband, he was in a full-time army. Uh, he was national guard, but after nine 11, the tone of the national guard changed, right? He was a high school teacher. Um, but the tone changed. And so I was having my fourth kid and the, even the National Guard was like, and like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, you know, so that was National Guard. That wasn't Marine Corps. That wasn't anything. And they gave him a very hard time about, you know, wanting to be there when his child was born. And so I don't even know what it would be like, you know, higher up in the in the more like full time forces um, and huge respect to all of you for for going through all that and doing what you do. And it is a it is a decision you have to make, right? Like, you have to really believe in, in what you're doing, because there's a trade off for that service. Yes, it is. It's a decision that we all make. We yeah. didn't join the military, because it's an outstanding pay. And you go, no, we joined the military to be part of the military in our life. I, that's what I joined for. You know, uh, as as a young kid, I said, I want to be a Marine. I was younger for that, but uh, I knew it was going to be hardships. It's not going to be, you know, living in the dirt, living on a ship. We're not living on a, a, on a cruise liner. You know, we got, we're living on racks that are 18 inches apart from somebody stacked five high, you know, close uh, compartments and spaces. No, it's not like a luxury tour. 
No. But we, everybody in the military, we signed up for that. We, we knew they're going to be hardship because we wanted a challenge. I wanted a challenge. That's why I joined the Marines. I wanted a challenge. Careful what you wish for, right? That's right. <laughs> so about moving around uh, when you were younger, I saw one interview you did and you have um, something you said. You said, my family was poor, but we learned how to use it as an advantage in life. Can you talk about some of the ways that you were able yeah, to yes. do that? Uh, well, what happened was, you know, we, I, I have a, uh, my two younger brothers and my mother that was very sick. And my father left us when we were 13. So we lived on welfare. And we're lucky enough to have a good family, you know, my uncles and aunts, which my uncles, also, you know, most of them served in World War II. So, but when my mother was in the hospital, where were my, my aunts or uncles or my grandmothers, my grandfather, grandmother taking care of us. Uh, but we got through that. I mean, everybody, you know, through hardships, we didn't have all the luxury clothes and everything else, but we went to work. I mean, I was a dishwasher during the summertime. I uh, installed swimming pools and I started that as a teenager, Yeah, as a teenager, 13 years old. I delivered newspapers when I was in fifth and sixth grade. I, uh, you know, I started doing that. I, on my bicycle, delivering newspapers, the long Island press. And then, Came a dishwasher as a teenager when I'm in uh, junior high and high school. And then during the summertime, installed swimming pools, me and my cousins, my brother. Was and that like a family money. business that you went to work in? Well, my uncle had the pool business. Right. So we worked for him. I got $5 an hour to install a swimming, you know, a swimming pool. We put two, depending on the size, up to one or three swimming pools a day. But did that throughout my summer, get up at six o'clock in the morning, come back around 5.30, 6 o'clock and take a shower and then go to the park and play paddle ball and, and of course, drink. But yeah. You know. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. You got to have all, all work and no play, right? That's correct, as a young kid. But yeah, that's, you know. But, but that helped me. And, and I played a lot of sports in school too. So that helped me staying in shape for the Marine Corps. I, I ran and played lacrosse we play i played soccer i wanted to play football things like that so what was it about the marine corps that you said this is the branch for me well when i was a young kid see, seeing the stands of iwo jima with john wayne which john wayne was my big hero as a kid growing up i said i'm going to join the marine corps and all my cousins and everybody else kid me on that but one day when i was, a, I was 17 years old and i was installing swimming pools on my lunch break I went to the recruiter. I had hair down to my shoulders, headband on, uh, and uh, walked into the recruiting office. <laughs> you look just like, like a Marine. Marine yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, exactly look like a Marine. And I said, uh, I'd like to join the Marines. So I signed up, and I, couldn't, I didn't let my family know or my mother because she, she would have to sign uh, at 17. So three days after my 18th birthday, I was in boot camp. Ooh, surprise, mom. Yep. And, yeah. And uh, that kicked off everything. That was great. What Pretty did your... Uh, Paris Island. What path did your brothers take? My brothers, my youngest brother, he's in the army still today. And his, one of his sons are in the army That's uh, on that. My, uh, my brother, Danny in the middle, uh, he started, he took a path of finding out what he wants to do. And in my family, my grandfather uh, was a bricklayer and a foreman and built a lot of New York City buildings uh, when it was uh, in the city. My uncle was after the war, they all came bricklayers and foremen. And uh, he followed that path. And now he has his own business and he works in the Hamptons and things like that. Awesome. But he followed a path of, you know, the you know working in the city as a bricklayer yeah. building uh, the skyscrapers. Yeah. Yeah, so you're 18 years old in boot camp. I'm a mom. I have four boys, right? They're 21, 20, 19, and 17. I love them. I can't picture any of them standing on those yellow footprints. <laughs> like I just, <laughs> what is that like as an 18 year old to be standing right there? Well, it's a very big shock when people are screaming at you. But I, right. I you know, I was kind of a wise kid before I went in there, but. 
that first week, after that first week of uh, you're standing there, people are just screaming at you. You don't know what's going on. You're taken into the barracks, giving all your possessions away, taking a shower, and then getting issued uniforms. I mean, three days of, re of reception, and then boom, to your unit. It's a big shock. Everything is moving real quick, which you never had before. But then it's like anything in boot camp. I loved it. But after a week, you figure out what's going on. In, 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 in the, uh, and you have to go with the program. And yeah. they really, they take you down, they get rid of you, and they build you up. Like I was, I was lucky. What I mean by that is I watched a lot of – I was into sports, so I was not um, – you know, for running and for doing push-ups, the biggest thing was pull-ups. I never did a lot of pull-ups as a young kid. That was the hardest part, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> so how long from um, standing there on those footprints to your first deployment? Like, what was that? How long well, did you have to Well, to burst it's so funny. I came in the Marine Corps for two years. I joined the Marine Corps for only two years. They had that back then in 1973. So after three months of boot camp, in Paris Island, I was sent off to uh, California. I went to infantry training school in California. And uh, that was about a month and a half, and then right to Okinawa, right after I finished there, off to Okinawa. So I graduated in boot camp January 28th. I left to Okinawa on April 7th, April, no, I think it was about April 14th, Okinawa. Was I never been west of the Mississippi in my life? <laughs> Couldn't say that anymore after that day. No, no. So you were over on some operations that may sound familiar. I think your Operation Desert Storm was one of them. I was operation. in an Operation Desert Storm, correct? Operation. Where do I have this written down? Operation Saber, and a couple That's others right. that that people would recognize. What is that? Then were there any moments? Um, significantly in those operations that really sort of struck out in your mind, uh, stick out in your mind today? Well, yeah, I just like what sticks out in my mind today is I did I'll go back to the operation of uh, Eagle Pool with the evacuation of uh, Saigon. We brought on 2,600 uh, Vietnamese on the, on the uh, USS Hancock. I was with one um, nine and, uh, so funny, I did a movie called The Green Dragon. And one of those little girls that were on the ship was a makeup artist on that show. And we did a article for the scout, which is a Camp Pendleton scout. Yeah, she was one of the little girls that were evacuated when I was there on the ship as a young, I was 19 years old then, 19 years old corporal. And she was one of the, uh, the evacuees on that ship on the USS Hancock. How did you find that out? We were talking because it was all about the Green Dragons, about the Vietnamese that were brought to, uh, you know, we dropped them off in the Philippines, and then they were brought to the United States. And they had a camp in Camp Talaga, at Camp Peloton, that we had the Quonset Huts, and that's where I was with 1st Recon Battalion. And that's where they stayed, 18,000. They put up tents and everything. And when we were doing the movie with the, uh, the, with the, uh, the Bowie brothers, they were both the young kids that were on the baby lift and they were directors for this Vietnamese uh, movie and uh, Patrick Swayze played a Marine Gunny on it and he was in, uh, with the camp so we we're talking and I was saying yeah I did the evacuation that's why I'm doing helping out with this movie here and she said and I was on the USS Hancock and she says that's the ship I was on and then the Marine Corps got a hold of that and they did an article for the paper on that yeah so um, it, when you're on these sets and recreating these moments and training these guys, are there any moments that are, is it ever hard for you to, to recreate some of these or does it ever like, bring things back? I don't know. For instance, like when you watch, uh, was it Flags of Our, Flags of the Flags of our fathers. fathers, yes. You know, and they made these poor guys recreate that that scene over and over and over again. You see how very difficult it was for them to be forced to relive all that. Um, were there any moments when you're recreating any of these scenes that 
it sort of took you back to a moment in service or you're struggling with, or did you see any veterans that you work with on set, um, you know, maybe st struggle or have to get past that? I, all the, the movies that I've done, I haven't seen uh, veterans or myself struggle, but we bring back memories of, Hey, remember this and all that, but not struggle with it. Um, we all, because the veterans that I bring on set oh, from the Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and Army, they're great guys. And they've all been, you know, to Afghanistan or Iraq. But uh, and they, when we did it in the, in the States, uh, American Sniper, no, they, they just brought back memories of, to them, good memories, you know, when they're in the camp or things like that. Because uh, when we talk about what's going on and everything like that. So it wasn't like difficult, but it was like oh, bringing back memories and we all start talking about it. But that's, yeah. You know, the, so in a good way. Did. In a good way. Correct. Because they're right. happy to be there too. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. So what are some things about creating a movie that the average moviegoer, like I go down, I sit down, I watch a movie. I'm very, maybe you can answer this question for me as it comes to it. How is it that you guys can create all like Godzilla and major battle scenes why can nobody film a scene in a car that's like real why do you all have these little like stupid little cars that it just looks it's so annoying to me <laughs> <laughs> what's what's the hold up why is a car scene so difficult why do they keep using fake cars when you get yeah, tom cruise out of a helicopter i mean but something about shooting a scene in a car just nope you're not doing it yeah i, I know you like when we shoot scenes in a Humvee or a car, yeah. there's a person on top of the vehicle. The, the vehicle is not being driven by the driver. Right. Because of the actor. But then for easy scenes, yeah, of course, the actor is driving the, the vehicle. But they want for the safety of the actors. That's why. So they can jump out of helicopters <laughs> and they can jump off buildings and they can shoot blanks at each other. But... Like for real, that's the issue. They don't want. It's it's a completely different. I know what you're saying, <laughs> but a lot of times, even the the stunts that are with the actors in the helicopters, they're yeah. stunt doubles and everything else. It's mostly right. safety for all the actors, so and the stuntmen take over for all that. You know? Okay, I'm still waiting for the movie that I ever see that is like, or they do, I don't know. It just, what, my fiance, Dave, he can't stand watching movies with anytime we get to the scene in the car, he's like, shut up. I know you're going to say it. I'm like, I just, I don't know. I don't know, but I don't think I'm alone in that. I think we, we all wonder what is, why can't there be a realistic driving in a car scene? That's just, not that you asked, but, no. uh, <laughs> but, but, but that's why you got, <laughs> whoops. It's a mystery to me. And many others as well, I think, too. All okay. right. So but other, so now that we've answered that long lasting question, is there anything else about um, movies in general or you know, the creation of the movies? Like a lot of people probably don't understand. I didn't realize that even the background actors went to a couple of weeks or a couple of days of boot camp to to get real. You know, you think these actors just roll up on set. They have these lines memorized or, you know, catered to and all this jazz. Uh, but it's really it's more to it than that. Oh, it's a lot more to it. You got pre-production in that they're figuring out how they're going to, which scenes they're going to shoot to build the sets also, you know, to, to build the sets. And then they're finding out how many personnel they need, how many stuntmen are needed for, with the stunt coordinator. And then what kind of training that we need to do with the, with the background. The background has to be trained. Like for American Sniper, we... We had interpreters and they did a great job because kicking in doors, all the shots that we shot in Morocco are the Marines kicking in the doors and the seals coming in and the door. But those are Moroccans and they really enjoyed the training. We're talking about three days of hard training out there, yeah. learning tactics with our interpreters and, uh, and then showed it on screen. Now, when I got to the States, it was easy. I had, I had real military guys doing the scenes. And I just had to tell them hey, what we have to do. But, but a lot of the background that you have on the set, they have to be trained how to carry the weapons and show what to do. Same thing with the actors. Training the actors. Uh, 
you know, just because they did one movie in World War II doesn't mean now we're doing a modern day movie, how to carry the weapons and then the equipment they have to carry. Because when you start putting the modern day vest on, the helmet, and then all the magazines and, go, and the real weapon, they go, this is heavy. I said, but you got a fake vest on. A real one weighs a lot more than you're wearing. And they, yeah. they appreciate what's going on and they like it. I mean, because they're, they're trying to figure out, wow, you mean you have to move with this gear? I said, yes. Yeah. yeah. It's so more to it. You watch it on TV yeah. or, the, or the movies, but when you're wearing 45 pounds of gear on you, it's not that easy. Yeah, more to it than you see, really. Um, what's the difference in how you, I mean, how much prep time did you have to work on your first film? And you were you were told that you're, hey, go meet Clint Eastwood and you're going to go work on this film. Were you like, what? Like, yeah. I mean, did you even see that coming? You just get up one day and then suddenly you're meeting Clint Eastwood and now you're working on movies? <laughs> Well, that was, that's funny. My colonel, I was working in the three shop. That's the operations. And he came up and says, Clint Eastwood's going to be here. He's playing a gunny. I want you to be with him, answer any questions and bring the Marines on board that he needs for the scenes. I said, Roger that. Okay. I never that worked That doesn't on a suck to get that assignment. Like no, when you get I up, you're going to meet Clint movie Eastwood. Before, yeah. But it was, it doesn't, it doesn't suck at all. I yeah. said, wow. <laughs> that's not a bad day. No. And yeah. uh, every day was great work. And it's funny, working every day, getting the Marines there and, uh, and Clint Eastwood's uh, playing, you know, Gunny Highway. And, and then you got the actors. But they didn't go through no boot camp. We didn't put any boot camp through those Marines, but they get to see how the other Marines at, at Talega, that's where we uh, filmed it, in Camp Pendleton and with the 1st Recon uh, Battalion, and um, they see how they were getting and they fell into that because they would talk to the Marines. And then one day we're doing the repel tower. If you ever saw Heartbreak Ridge, mm -hmm. me on the repel tower, hooking up Mario Van Peebles. And um, after that, we broke to eat. Okay. Regular chow, you know, and all of a sudden me and my friend, uh, Staff Sergeant uh, Tom Mender, we go over there they're having steak and lobster for at Tony's catering. And going, this this is not normal. What do you mean steak and lobster? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you find, that was pretty funny on the day when we finished the repelling scene and we're sitting down. I felt guilty for eating the food. <laughs> but you ate it, right? Of course. Can't waste it. That would be no, worse. That no, would be worse. No. <laughs> but, yeah, eating with the crew and going, really? Wow. In the chow hall, we don't get this. No. So what's the difference in how you approach that very first film when you were just sort of thrown into it, right? Versus how you approach a film now when well, it's what I, you do. That film, I learned a lot. I mean, I didn't know everybody's jobs, what the first AD does, what the second, what the props master does, and, you know, everybody with the stand-ins. I didn't know a camera or a wardrobe. I knew nobody's job. I was just, you know, probably stepping in people's way. Yeah. But then I learned from that, oh, everybody has a different job like in the Marine Corps, you know? I got it. Yeah. Well, the director's the colonel in charge of the operation. Okay. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so I started putting it in, in ranks like that You ranked way. everyone, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, oh, I got it now. The, the first AD is like the sergeant major controlling the set, you know, just like a sergeant major or first sergeant or gunny controls the men with the company command over time command. I put the, all that just like the Marine Corps, mm -hmm. what's that in the rank structure of everybody's job. And then you can triage everything that's, from there. That, that's correct. Yep. All right. That makes sense. That's a very um, precise kind of calculated approach to do it. Set of all the the helter skelter there. What's the moment you had on a set that sort of took you by surprise that maybe you had to react to some unforeseen mishap? Mishap. You see now. You see mishap. Um, oh yeah, uh, the mishap. It wasn't really a mishap, but yeah, we were doing a last samurai, and, the, and when they see all the Japanese. Uh, uh, army marching next to a big fire building that heat i was off the side and i got to tell you with the japanese and out of those 500 japanese about 10 of them spoke english 
they did an outstanding job. They were playing samurai and they were playing the, the, uh, the soldiers. So they're playing drew roles at the same time. But that heat was so hot when Tom Cruise on the horse and they were walking by, but they were all troopers. They stayed there. We had to push them out back because the heat was getting so hot. It took us by surprise how fast that building went up. So we had to get them out away from there because they would, you know, you start getting, you know, uh, you know, feel the heat of the yeah. uniform. We didn't want anything to happen. So we pushed them out real quick. So, well, at least yeah, you didn't make them sit in a car and drive on that set. Cause that, <laughs> <laughs> that would have been over the top. <laughs> All right. So I, we hear a lot today in today's political climate, today's country seems like a little bit insane. There's a lot of just insanity out there on all on all edges and on all branches. And Hollywood's taken a big hit for a lot of celebrities coming out and saying things that are uh, unpopular with half the country and popular with half the country. And so Hollywood has thrown its hat into the political arena um, are you finding that this is having any impact on your work in particular as your work changed because political views are shifting or, you know, I have, I have some friends that are working in Hollywood. Um, you know, we come out with our own views, Dave and I do, and I have started speaking up and I have a couple of friends who are like, I could never say that. Like they text me quietly. Oh, that's great. But I could never say that or I'll never work again, you know, kind of thing. Um, so is any of that trickling down into films you're working on or have you seen like a shift in well obviously covid you're not really not doing things that, that you're right doing now. right right hollywood shut down on march 13th right and um it's slowly starting up but i haven't seen i just did reshoots for without remorse uh, a couple of weeks ago and no um we had to do all the safety procedures for the you know, coronavirus and everything else. But um, I don't see, and I don't get into politics when I'm on set. I got a job to do and that's a job I, that they're paying me to do. And I'm going to do that job, my best ability. So I don't get into the politics at all. Um, I'm there to do a job. I'm going to do it. And I'm, everybody understands that. I'm not going to play games. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, but no, in my way, it hasn't, but it's Hollywood has slowed down now. We're just starting uh, productions. Uh, films that are filming now started before March 13th, and they're finishing them up. Uh, but new films, there's a couple starting up. So it's going very slow right now. Yeah. Finding out, you know, because the theaters are not, you know, not open in a lot of places. But uh, I don't see it affect me at all in the political or uh, and I, I, I say I stay out of it. Yeah. Do you see a trend in movies that are coming down the pike? Is there one kind of set in terms of military type movies? Um, are there are there more of them, less of them, no change in them? Is there like a different era that's being focused on now? No, right now they're still doing uh, action movies, uh, some with... Um, you know, modern day, like the one I did last year, uh, the reshoots, that's modern day uh, Navy SEALs. But um, World War II and Vietnam War looks like they're coming back. Uh, you know, there, there's uh, Tom Hanks, his movie just came out, Greyhound, that was World War II in the North Atlantic. Uh, but no, they're more training on, I think uh, right now, uh, Action pack, like person was in the military. Now he's out defending his family or things oh, like that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone doing, gets kidnapped. Doing movies and, like that. Yeah. Doing, I will find you and I will kill you. Yes. That's right. <laughs> uh, but yeah. no, I think so. It's been the same way up and down. How many military movies and what period uh, are, are, are doing movies? All right. Um, so one thing we talk about here, I mean, we started American Snippets because even three years ago, we were seeing the divisiveness in this country. And for me, again, uh, as a military widow, and I'm invested in the military community, I, it was impacting me personally to just hear people talk about how they hated our country and how nobody can achieve anything. The American dream is dead. But I knew that was not true. I knew that was different because the people that came into my life uh, and how they impacted me. and. I, we started talking more and more about the American dream, but 
what we uh, focus on, I'm making a point of saying, is that the American dream looks different for everybody. So yes, it is alive and well, but it's not the same for everybody. What one person thinks is the American dream is another person's nightmare, right? So um, we always like to talk to people and find out what what's your version of the American dream? What does it mean to you? My version of American dream is, uh, I, I'm living it. That's how I look at it is, I look at it as I was a young kid. I don't know where I was going. And the Marine Corps for those 25 years gave me my uh, commitment, my, I, I, by my traits, you know, honor, courage, and commitment. And it really, I was focused on the Marine Corps. Without the Marine Corps, I don't know where I would be right now. Uh, I, like I mentioned before, I came in for two years. I loved it so much. It's in that two years, what I saw in two years, uh, I couldn't believe it. I was everywhere in those two years. I mean, I went from East Coast, Paris Island, to California, to Okinawa. And so all the countries from Hong Kong, Korea, uh, evacuation back to Okinawa, and then uh, Singapore. Then they sent me all the way to North Carolina to be out there. In, in 1975, I said, wow. I said, I'm going for another two years. And I volunteered for uh, we, a second reconnaissance battalion out there. And that changed my life too. Be, I was in the grunts when I was in Okinawa, but I wanted to go in the reconnaissance field once I saw the, uh, recon, the reconnaissance uh, Marines in Okinawa. And I said, wow, I volunteered from that. And that was a big stepping point for me. And, and then a boom took off from there. And I give it for my dream was, I love the Marine Corps to this day. I still love the Marine Corps and I still use the Marine Corps and I work in the movies and who, and then I was talked about going in the movies and I was in the Marine Corps. I got laughs about that too, that I'm going to go into the movies. Well, Clint Eastwood helped on that. I had to meet my goals first. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> yeah. After heartbreak Ridge, I said, I'm going to go into the movies. And, but I still had a long way to go, but I had goals in the Marine Corps first to meet. Once I met all those goals, which I did, and that's when I decided, and uh, I put in my retirement papers, and I got out and knocked on doors to get in the movie business. So I, that's my American dream is uh, following your, have small goals, achieve those goals, and then have the, the major goals was the Marine Corps, and in Hollywood, and, and then achieve those goals and continue looking for goals in the future. And that's what I've been doing. And uh, that's what I call the American dream, putting your goals out there and achieving them, going at it. Doesn't matter if the diversity of people saying you can't do it, trying to bring you down. And that went throughout my life. I said, I'm gonna be a Marine and I'm gonna get in Hollywood too. That's awesome. how I look at it. When you got out of the military, did you knock on, like, were you able to like call up Clint and be like, hey, uh, remember me? Or did you have to like work around? Because you worked on more movies with him. Did that happen through other channels or were you able to just call him directly? No, I didn't call him directly, but I worked on, uh, you know, small movies. And then I went, then when I heard about Flags of Our Fathers, with because I did Clint Eastwood didn't do another military movie after Heartbreak Ridge and Two Flags of Our Fathers. I called up the office and said, I'd like to, you know, come out to be an advisor, you know, for Flags of Our Fathers. And they'll let me, you know, I put my paperwork in. I was on Jarhead at the time working in the in El Centro in the desert, and I got a call for an interview. And I said, Great, uh, I'll be back in uh. California in two weeks. I said, I was in California. I'll be back into set in two weeks. And then I set up a meeting, met with, uh, and Clint Eastwood remembered myself. And I got the job for Heartbreak Ridge. I mean, for Flags of Our Fathers. Cool. What would be your advice to somebody now who's looking to get into the film industry, the, the movie industry, as an actor or as a, an advisor? Well, if I was, you know, an actor, learn your, learn your trade, uh, go to school to be an actor. When I say an actor, they have a lot of acting classes. I'm not an actor, but, but uh, this I can tell people I can't dance neither, but I can. <laughs> but uh, 
do that training. And if you're going to be a military advisor, know your traits of period pieces and modern day. There's a lot of movies being made today of period pieces and they're carrying the equipment. The weapons are all completely wrong because we didn't carry the weapons like we do now back in World War II. So it's completely different. Does that but, annoy you if you're sitting in the movies and you're like, yes. <laughs> like oh, the car really, scenes with me? Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, it's like the car scenes with yeah. you. Carrying weapons yeah. in a period piece like they carry now, yes, it annoys me. I go, <laughs> Be <"What?"> careful what, <laughs> going to the movies with you then. <laughs> That's right. Just like you with the car. <laughs> yeah. You and I should probably never go see a military movie together or really no, any movie that there's a car. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'll bring the tequila. All right, sir. Thank you very much for taking the time to to sit down and share your story with us. It really is cool. I feel like we could go into all these different areas, talk about all these different films you worked on and all this. Maybe we can get you back to talk about a specific thing. If you have any projects coming up, big ones, you know, we're happy especially to have you back have you back? Oh, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. I, I yeah. really enjoyed myself. Good times. Good times. And of course, thank you for your service. And I say that very sincerely. Thank you. Thank you.